of all the times that we've said things we shouldn't and hurt others in our anger, there's probably multiple, multiple more times when that happened and we weren't even aware of it. I need to do something about my anger. My anger is a problem. I want us to talk about four things, admit four things to ourselves about our anger, okay? Four things we each need to admit. And number one, my anger is selfish. Anger comes from a place of selfishness. The truth is, and you'll probably, you've probably never heard it said this way, anger feels good. Anger is very, a very rewarding emotion, at least in the moment. When you get angry, now most of the time you may feel like you're not that impressive a person. If you're like most people, you're not that impressed with yourself. But when you're angry, you suddenly feel very righteous. You feel very on top of things. You feel like you are the hero of the story and that other person is the villain. And you are 100% on the side of good and they are 100% on the side of evil. And that's a very validating feeling, especially because as I've already shared, our world rallies to you at that point. Our world comes to you and says, you're right. Yeah, yeah, go for it. But think about what we get angry about. What kinds of things stir anger in us? That beat up Honda Civic cuts us off, headed south on I-45, driving 75 miles an hour, and you honk your horn and they extend that one special digit towards you, right? You show up at work and find out that one of your coworkers has spread rumors about you that are untrue and that are very embarrassing and damaging to your reputation. Your ex is late bringing the kids home from his or her time with them, and that means you have to adjust your schedule uh, and change some things and cancel some things. You get home uh, after work one day or, or some big responsibility, and, and you're dead tired, and all you want to do is just sit on the couch and watch TV and relax, but your kids won't stop fighting, and they just constantly, constantly fight with one another, and you have to keep getting up and getting up and, and correcting them. And I... I I know how any of those things would make me angry if I were in your shoes. But there's a reason why verse 21 that we started with says, receive with meekness the implanted word, which can save our souls. Meekness is gentleness. It's humility. It's strength under control. It's, it's the ability to say, I admit that I have a problem. It's receiving with meekness means that when, when we hear something that makes us angry from God, God saying you need to change, we say, okay, you're right. Admit that our anger is selfish. Number two, admit that my anger is destructive. I want you to think for a moment, and I know this isn't going to be any fun, but think for the time when you said something that you'd like to take back when you said something to someone else that you wish you could go back in time and erase from their memory and from yours. Maybe you just snapped one day and you shouted something or you said some cruel comment, or maybe it was more deliberate. Maybe you've been waiting and waiting until you could say this very calculated thing that would cut them down to size. And then after you said it, you realized, oh, that I went too far. Or maybe you were talking about someone behind their back and then somehow that evil thing you said got to them and they were deeply hurt. But we've all been there, right? Many of us have been there multiple times. You know, it's very humbling to think about the fact that of all the times that we've said things we shouldn't and hurt others in our anger, there's probably multiple, multiple more times when that happened and we weren't even aware of it. When we didn't know someone was listening or, or we didn't know that they took that cruel thing we said it personally, or, or maybe we didn't know that they got word that what we'd said about them was so damaging. And, and, and yet, think about this, even worse. Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. I don't know about you, but I find that one of those terrifying verses in the whole Bible. And I don't think it's literally going to be the case that God's going to have a, a screen in heaven and he's going to show video clips of every, every thoughtless, careless, stupid, damaging, destructive, profane thing we've ever said. But what if he did? Think about that. He doesn't miss a thing. And everything that's damaging, we'll, we'll have to answer for it someday. 
And if you say, well, the good news for me, Jeff, is I'm not really the, vo vo the verbal kind of person. I don't, I don't speak in anger. I don't shout at people. I don't say what's on my mind. Well, good for you. That's great. But if instead you're the hold on to it and nurse it inside your heart and think about all the things you'd like to say to them, if you're that kind of person, be very careful because in some ways that's even worse because that kind of anger leads to contempt. You know what contempt is? Contempt is when you get to the point where you don't really see them as human anymore. They're just an annoyance. It's, it's the wife who can't speak about her husband without rolling her eyes. It's the teenager who just can't wait to get away from his mom and dad because they are the absolute worst. It's, it's when we have these imaginary conversations with that person that we can't stand, where we, we tell them all the evil and wicked and nasty things that we think would put them in their place. That's contempt. And what it does is it, it brings us to a point where we think that the biblical command to love your neighbor doesn't apply in their case. It's toxic to our souls. And as much as uh, being the person that just spews your anger verbally is horrible and it hurts multiple people, holding it inside and keeping it nursed inside of you, turning into contempt, poisons you and, and, and destroys you. So our anger is destructive. Number three, admit that my anger is not necessary. And this is the hard part. The first two you can probably at least sort of agree with. But I, I say that anger is like the abusive boyfriend that everybody has. And what I mean by that is sad to say we've all known young women, and maybe you've been one of these young women, uh, who dated somebody who was no good for them, who was manipulative, who was evil, who was, uh, who was physically abusive maybe, or at least verbally abusive, and everybody tells her, hey, you need to get away from that guy, and she keeps making excuses. Oh, he's, he's not as bad as you think. He's so sweet behind closed doors. Anger is our abusive boyfriend, every single one of us. It's the, it's the quality that everybody wishes we'd get rid of, and we keep making excuses. Deep down inside, we know it's no good for us, but we keep rationalizing and saying, well, you know, that's just how I am. Our anger is not necessary. And your anger, for some of you, is an idol that is clinging to you. Like, again, like that abusive boyfriend, like, don't, don't get rid of me. You can't live without me. And some of you think, but if I, if I lose my anger, then I'll lose my edge. It's what motivates me. But 1 Corinthians 13 says love should motivate us. If we're motivated by anything other than love, we're not fit for the kingdom of God. Uh, but if, if I give up my anger, then I'm afraid the mean people in my life will win. Well, you know what? Holding on to anger against people is like drinking poison and hoping the other guy will drop dead. Well, I, I, don't, I don't know how to explain it, but my anger just feels good. Well, you know, fire feels good on a cold day, but if your house is on fire, I hope you don't stand there warming your hands. Dallas Willard is one of the wisest Christians of the last hundred years in my mind, and he wrote these words, there is nothing that can be done with anger that can't be done better without it. I read that some years ago, and ever since then, every time I read it, I think it's more true than it was before. I've, this is one of the truest non-biblical statements I've ever read, and, and, in, and yet whenever I share it, and I do from time to time, people will push back on it and say, yeah, but, there's always a yeah, but. but, but I have to discipline my kids. Absolutely you do. If you don't make your kids mad sometimes, if you don't hurt your kids' feelings sometimes, you're not a good parent, but you do a better job of that if you do it when you're not angry. If you do it in emotion, if you do it in rage, then it never works out well. Well, but I have to supervise people at work. I have to crack down on people who are slacking off. I might have to fire somebody. I might have to ream somebody out. Okay, good, I understand. I have to supervise people too. But again, it's better if you can do it with a level head. Well, but I don't want to be run over. I don't want to be taken advantage of. I agree. And there's nothing Christian about letting bullies win. But again, in all three cases, I've tried it both ways. You do better when you do these things in wisdom, in self-control, than when you do them in anger. Every single time. Anger may be what motivates you to actually address something, but you better get over that anger before you address it. Dallas Willard again writes, to cut the root of anger is to wither the tree of human sin. 
We don't even realize how many other sins are based on the anger, the, like, a, like a backpack full of explosives we carry around everywhere. We don't realize how many of our sins are related to that. If we just set that backpack down, if we just gave it up, how much of our life would change for the better, the joy that would return to our lives, the peace, the tranquility in our relationships, the, the love because people would suddenly be so glad at the change in us. The, I, I'm just here to promise you, again, it's like your abusive boyfriend. You don't realize once you give it up, your whole life will be better and you'll never want to go back. And then the fourth and final thing I want us to admit to ourselves, Jesus alone can change me. Now, there is a place for counseling. I believe in the necessity of and the power of counseling, biblical counseling, psychological help. Uh, I've talked to people who've taken anger management classes that say there are techniques that help them cope better, and if that works for you, great. Uh, I know there are people who are helped by medication, and that's good too. But we realize with all those, we're not talking about the core issue. The core issue is sin. And there's really only one thing that can deal with sin. The, again, verse 21 says, we need the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. The implanted word. See, we have a heart defect, and our heart defect is because we are sinners. And, and the only cure for a heart defect is not medication, and it's not techniques, and it's not counseling. It's, it's a transplant. We need a new heart. And that can only come from the one great physician, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus died to give us a new heart a new life. That's why people who will, who will hear this and say, well, Jeff, you're, you understand I'm already saved. Well, well, great. Hallelujah. I believe you. But realize that Jesus didn't just die to save you from hell. He died to save you from your sin. In fact, when you read the Bible, especially the Gospels and the, and the rest of the New Testament, and you ask yourself, what is, what is it talking about when it refers to salvation? Very rarely does the Bible talk about salvation in terms of uh, because of this, you don't go to hell. Because of this, you go to heaven. Most of the time, the Bible talks about salvation in terms of you get to change. You get to become a new person. You get to leave your sins behind and, and embrace a brand new life. You get to take off the dirty clothing of your, of your shame and your sin and your guilt and put on the righteousness of Christ. Jesus wants to give you that heart, that, that heart transplant today so that you can live with new life, new life forevermore. I just want to share this one more thing and then I'm done, and that is I want you to think about Jesus the Gospels tell us that when he was about 30, he went out into the wilderness, down by the Jordan, a very desolate area down in, in, in northern Israel, and got baptized by John the Baptist. But before he went into his ministry, before he started going and preaching and doing miracles, he was baptized in the Jordan, and immediately, the Bible says, he went into the wilderness. Wilderness means desert. I've been there. I've seen it. It's desolate. There's nothing can't sustain life. Jesus spent 40 days out there. No food, no water. Sustained only by the Spirit of God. Spending time with His Father. And someone was there to meet Him. Someone who had known Him since before the dawn of time. And Satan knew that if he could get the Son of God to sin even once, he knew who Jesus was. He knew what He had come to do. If he could convince Him to crack just once, then all humanity would be lost because he would no longer be the sinless sacrifice for our salvation. And so he threw everything at Jesus over those 40 days that he had in his arsenal. And Jesus resisted every single one. And hallelujah for that. But at the end of that story, it says in Luke 4.13 that the devil left him until an opportune time. It's interesting. Luke never comes back and says, okay, this is the opportune time he was looking for. I think it's because there were multiple times in Jesus' life when he was physically at his weak point, when he was strained emotionally, mentally, and when the devil knew, okay, if he's ever going to crack, now's the time. I, I, know, I know, for instance, when the scribes and the Pharisees lied about Jesus' motives and his character, that had to have been an opportune time. When his own brothers mocked him, when his own hometown people tried to throw him off a cliff and stone him to death. 
When he saw rich people feasting while poor people like him had nothing, when he saw the Romans abusing his own people, the Jews, when a man who called himself his best friend denied him three times at his moment of need, when his other close friend handed him over to the enemy, that had to be an opportune time. When a gang of thugs arrested him, when a gang of hypocrites condemned him and blindfolded him and slapped him in the face, when soldiers flayed the skin off his back and pressed a crown of thorns on his head and mocked him with a purple robe, that was an opportune time. When they put nails in his hands and feet and suspended him in midair and they spat in his face and they ridiculed him. In any of those moments, you and I, if we'd had the power, would have sought vengeance. We would have put those people in their place. Jesus had that power. He could have done whatever he wanted to his enemies. And he held back. If he'd he'd cracked even once, if he'd stood up for himself as we would define it, we would all to this day and forever be lost. But instead, he stayed the course. He held his temper. He even prayed for those who hated him. And I tell you all that because it's the best story, the most important story ever. But I also tell you that Because if he did that and he died for your sins, which he did, then that means he can put that character into you. And it doesn't happen overnight. There's not a a, a software upgrade that the Lord puts into your operating system that changes your nature forever in an instant. But instead, it's more like we come to him again and again and again and we say, Lord, I'm still not there yet, but I admit that I need you. My anger is selfish. It's destructive. It's not necessary. I want to leave it behind. Show me how. And God sends into our lives godly people who will be examples to us and godly people who will hold us accountable And God keeps changing us through the power of his Holy Spirit as we continue to pray, Lord, teach me that long suffering, that patience that only you can give. So every time you start to feel justified in your anger, every time you make excuses for it, think of Jesus and let him change you.